Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in this world. And thank you for joining us for today's DevOps.com webinar, Building Your Continuous Delivery Pipeline, which is being brought to us today by CollabNet and Version 1. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. Before we get started with such a fabulous topic, uh, I would I do have a few um, housekeeping items to go over. First of all, we are recording today's webinar. So if you miss any or all of today's webinar, please know that you'll be able to listen to it on demand following the event. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the recording uh, as well as the slides uh, post event uh, by email. And then we will also have the event uh, on demand on devops.com. Also, we are taking audience questions. So at any time during today's webinar, if you have a question for our speakers, please just use the control panel there on your screen and submit your question. We'll take probably about 15 minutes or so near the end of the event and go through those questions. Okay, we have a, as I said before, a fabulous topic and two very great uh, presenters for today's event. I know we only have one on the screen, but believe me, there are two. The topic of today's event is building your continuous delivery pipeline, the nine deadly mistakes organizations make and a simple six-step plan to overcome them. Today we have Inbar Oren, who is methodologist and SAFE fellow at Scaled Agile, Inc. And then we also have, lurking in the shadows, Lee Cunningham, who is Senior Director of Enterprise Agile Strategy at CollabNet Version 1. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Right. So, uh, Inbar, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Maybe you can uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then dive right on in. Sure. So, um, I'm a methodologist and SAFE fellow at Scaled Agile. I've been... Um, a developer, a program manager. I've been working with companies to expand their lean and agile results for the last decade. Um, I've been with Scaled Agile for the last few years, helping um, really expand and build the framework, working with Rich Naster and uh, Dean Laughingwell. And um, doing everything in scale. I also have family in scale. I have five kids with two sets of twins. So. That's me. God bless you. <laughs> I don't think I could do two sets of twins, but <laughs> Lee, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, lurking is one of the things I do best, by the way. So I'm um, happy to lurk along today. Uh, also, I have five kids. No twins, though. Just small world, huh? Uh, uh, I'm the uh, working with uh, our, our enterprise customers at Version One for several years, uh, uh, like Inbar, I've had a lot of different, worn a lot of different hats in the technology field, from uh, from developer to to QA manager to program manager to uh, consultant and coach and trainer and curriculum developer and all sorts of things along the way. Um, more recently, I, uh, over the last two or three years, I've been working very closely with our enterprise customers, um, learning from them, uh, providing guidance to them as, you know, all over the world as, as these larger organizations try to figure out how to take what works at a team level and scale that up and, and uh, make that work at an enterprise level. So very glad to be along today. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you both again for joining us. Um, Inbar, why don't uh, I just turn things over to you and you can get started with your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the continuous delivery pipeline. This is a new construct that we brought to the front with Safe 4.5. And I want to talk a little bit about the nine deadly mistakes we've seen organization make and the simple six-step plan to actually overcome them. So what we see the first thing that we usually see is the mistake number one is underestimating the impact and importance of DevOps. Um, adapt or die. Since 2000, 52% of the names on the Fortune 500 list are gone. This is just a fact. Some of this is mergers, acquisitions, but a lot of it is people not reading the market. And we know some of those big names that have not understood the importance of really developing deploying, releasing, and working faster with customers. So the first mistake we see is people actually ignoring this, people thinking Agile or DevOps, those are fads, um, and or on the other side, I can just do one of them, 
this is a, a, a very important and, and fatal mistake. And this is, this is drawn out of the 2017 State of DevOps report. And you can just see some of the things that are the benefits for DevOps for high performers. And some of them make complete sense, less defects, faster lead times, faster recovery. But I think the ones at the bottom are, are astounding. More than twice employee net promoter score. That means that people are actually happier to be in those companies. And then the one on the left, twice more likely to exceed profitability goals. And this is, again, amazing. When people usually talk about Agile or DevOps and really think about the mechanics of it, they, 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 they connect it very quickly to we'll be able to release faster. But they don't see the overall effect of it. And exceeding uh, profitability, really growing as a company is huge. So we see this as a, as a really big mistake that a lot of people are ignoring this new world, ignoring the impact of it, or ignoring just part of it, saying I can do DevOps or do Agile, but I don't need to do both. The second mistake we usually see is people thinking, okay, we know what our customer want. And that's wrong. Um, there's the story about Ford that he said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said, we want faster horses. But it's, that, that's not even true. I mean, did, did, his, did his customer want faster horses? I mean, let's say he would have developed a teleporter, somewhere to get from point A to point B instantaneously. I'm guessing they would have said, that's better. So the customers wanted to get faster from point A to point B. The problem is, customers are really good at identifying what's wrong, but they're not very good at identifying a solution. So in that Ford was definitely right. They didn't say, I want a car. They just said, I wanted to get there faster. It's up to the supplier to, to come up with the innovation. So we come up with those great ideas all the time, but how do we know if they're right? So really building a kind of hypothesis-driven development cycle where I have an idea, then I'll build it. I'll measure it, I'll learn, and really make this running in a very short loop is critical, which a lot of people ignore. They'll have a great idea. A few years ago, we had this idea called Safe LSE. We thought this was the best invention since sliced bread because it was our idea. So obviously, it was awesome. But we created the, minimal, the minimalistic thing we can actually do, a minimal viable product. We then had some people in the room, really smart people, and we showed it to them, and we measured by asking them, what do you think? And they said, it's pretty cool, but we don't want it. We want one framework, not two frameworks. So we adjusted. We learned from this, and we created Safe 4.0, which actually included some of the concept of Safe 4.0 and Safe LSE into one framework. So really doing those tight cycles of understanding what customers actually want and validating it in the field is very crucial. The third mistake we see is so we, we have this hypothesis, we want to try it, we're starting to build, but we push the integration to the end. Now, people do this for a reason. It's not that they're stupid. We've all been doing and developing for a long time. Um, so why are they pushing integrations to the end? And the reality is we do it because it's just frightening. We know that we're going to have a lot of problems with integrations, so we want to push them toward the end of the, of the project. So there's this video called the Marshmallow Challenge, and it's kind of long, so I didn't put it here, but I highly recommend everybody on the call who's not familiar with it to go watch what is the Marshmallow Challenge. And it's basically a, a, a group activity that you can do with groups, and they're supposed to build this very interesting structure uh, from spaghetti and a marshmallow. And at the end of it, they put the marshmallow at the end, and it's supposed to stand. What tends up happening is that they build this huge structure. They're very proud of it. They think it's awesome. And then at the last minute, just as time is running out, they put the marshmallow at the end, and the whole thing collapses. So I've been playing this video for a long time, but knowledge doesn't equal understanding. So a few months ago, I was actually with my kids at an event here in um, Colorado, and they had a marshmallow challenge. So I said, oh, that's awesome. I'll get my kids to actually do them. I'll guide them along because I already know that you're supposed to try and integrate and work iteratively and actually check some of those things and put the marshmallow in early. 
And I also know that you're supposed to build self-reinforcing geometric shapes and all of this. So we went and we built our marshmallow challenge. And of course, we were pressed for time. And of course, we were f trying to come up with one solution among the, the, all of us. And it was really hard. And we ended up with exactly what happens to everybody else. At the end of it, we had something. It was the last second. We put the marshmallow on top. And as you can see, not a very inspiring marshmallow, not a very inspiring structure. We, we also pushed in the integration to the end. So when we see this happening again, so really the importance of iterative development and checking your assumption and validating continuously. I have this idea that this will work. Well, let's put the marshmallow. Does it stand? No, it doesn't. Okay, let's try something else. Had we done it more, we would have been more successful. So really treating everything, even if it's something you think you know. And I thought I knew how to build this structure because I played this video a million times. So validating my hypothesis by really integrating early and trying it would have netted me up with a much, much better result. Yeah, the end bar. I just, I, just, I was wanting to mention. I, I worked at a, at an organization a few years back where um, the integration was so painful it was months long. It was it was orders of magnitude longer than it took to develop um, the 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 system, and uh, the integration was became such a focus that the 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 solution that we tried was to try to to order our sequence of work our backlog such that it would make the integration easier we, we succeeded in that but we ended up in not producing anything of value so we had something that we could build and integrate much easier but it had no market value so trying to trying to find a workaround that, that doesn't um, doesn't focus on this on this uh, very quick iterative hypothesis hypothesis driven development and integration um, there are there are other ways to do it but it may not rep, uh, result in anything of value I agree Lee, because sometimes when you actually want to slice it up instead of thinking what can I build that will provide value and allow me to validate my hypothesis I actually build the easiest thing to integrate so I will start with something that is easy to integrate and is easy to build incrementally but doesn't provide value or doesn't allow me to validate my hypothesis right so what did you, so what did you guys end up end up doing with that. Yeah, so we, it, we ended up uh, actually, um, I ended up leaving that company. <laughs> that's how I solved that problem. <laughs> well, that's one way to solve it. <laughs> Another is, is really to, to identify what can be done and really work with product management and, and product owners to see how we can slice it, but also to understand that, and this was sometimes a, a, a miracle thing, when you actually deliver more often, it will focus you on improving that thing. Uh, let, let's get back to that later because we'll, we'll touch it in a different deadly mistake that organizations make. So the next mistakes we see is people are treating deployment and releasing as if they're the same thing. That's, that's a big mistake. If we see deployment and releasing as the same thing, then every time we deploy to production, we're basically releasing to our whole customer base. That means we need to be very careful and we can't deploy very often. Now, that's exactly not what we want to do. What we're trying to do with, with a scalable continuous delivery in DevOps is to actually decouple the concept of deployment and releasing. So we want to be able to deploy continuously to a production environment, but then release when there's a market demand for it. So when our market needs it, and not even all at once, so we'll deploy, and now we have a dark release. Maybe we can already see some things that are not working, that code is working, is in production, but it's not turned on. There's maybe a feature toggle keeping it off. And then we might release it, do canary releases. We'll release it to just a few members of the audience, uh, a small segment, and start seeing the results. Uh, how are they reacting to it, both from a business perspective and from a load perspective and from a defect perspective and really see how is it actually going? Is it working well? Are they, are, are they liking it? If so, we can extend it to more and more parts of our customer base instead of really locking ourselves to uh, we have to do it in a very specific thing. And I think this, this concept of decoupling the, the ideas of deployment from releasing is, is really valuable. And, and I wonder, Lee, what do you see with your customers uh, when you talk to the enterprise customers about the concept of deployment and releasing? 
mute button there. Uh, yes, yeah, very interesting. I think that's becoming more of a realization that uh, you may have uh, some strategic things that are going on that are have longer time spans of development uh, than than the need to de to deploy to the market. Uh, so there is the real the real need and a real demand for something that works, some framework that works, and some way of systematically thinking about things that allows them to be able to think strategically and to have some some consistency and some order to the way that they actually build things, but be able to be flexible enough to to um, uh, deploy as frequency or or deployed to the market, released to the market as, as frequently as the business demands. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and again, as you were saying, when, it, when we're building, especially, even if the, some of the organization get it for the small business things, when you're building larger architectural, infrastructural changes, this is where they say, oh, but this thing, since we're now re-architecting that whole thing, we'll do this in the side. And they're missing on the whole power of actually trying that out and seeing how it works and actually getting feedback and, and, and seeing things that they're working and getting to integration and deployment too late. And so they're missing out on a lot of value realization that can actually happen. The fifth mistake that we see is ignoring culture. And that's really, really important. In say 4.5, we've defined a we've augmented an existing term in the industry, the, the concern to a calmer. And we, we look at it as a calmer approach to DevOps. And that's because, it started with C, which is culture. And, and culture is so important. I mean, a lot of the time when we look at Dev and Ops, we're looking at two parts of the organizations that are a lot of the time at odds with each other. One part is trying to keep everything stable and make sure that everything is working well and operating well. The other part is trying to push new features out and pushing new ideas out. And they're both right. The problem is that a lot of organizations actually separate the two concepts. You have the operations team, you have the dev team, and they don't talk. And one of the important things that we have that we see as a, as a huge mistake is actually ignoring the impact of this cultural change. So people are trying to put um, mechanical things into actions such as let's automate the build process or let's automate the deployment process and automation is really important but if you ignore the cultural difference and the important to actually create a culture of shared responsibility between dev and ops then you're missing something you're missing an important and key um, thing that will actually uh, actually help you deliver faster so the other thing that we're seeing, which is a similar mistake, is people are actually creating DevOps teams. So they'll take people from Dev and people from Ops and create a new DevOps team. That's not the point. The point is actually getting people from across the flow of value to work together. And this starts with Dev and Ops, but it doesn't end there. What about people further upstream, like product management? What about people downstream, such as compliance, um, InfoSec? It's, it doesn't start and end with development and ops. We need to understand that if we want to deliver value faster, we have to get everybody across the flow of value, across the value stream, to actually come around to a single table, work together for a common goal. And, I mean, we all know this, this concept of, of the, from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. But it, that's exactly what it is. We want to empower people to take responsibility beyond where they're usually sitting in the value stream. So as a developer, my job doesn't end when I check in code. My responsibility is to make sure that that code is doing the right thing, is running in production, is being used by the customers, and really follow the whole hypothesis-driven development cycle from idea to realization of value. Now, this is really important. That means we actually want developers to have more responsibility. When they're pressing a button now, it doesn't just check in. It actually deploys to production. What does that mean? What does that mean for me as a developer? What do I need to do? What does that mean for my thinking when I'm checking code in? Well, I should have a better understanding of how the operation side of things work, and I should have... A, a, a real um, stability. And I think part of the reason that for me it was sometimes hard to get this, we were just at a summit and, and Jim Kim was talking about who has the pager. 
Well, my first job as a developer, just starting out, I had a pager. If something didn't work, they called me. So I always had this sense of responsibility for how things work and how things end up. But in a lot of organization, the developer's responsibility ends when he actually checks the code in, or maybe when they finish the integration, pass it over the wall, throw it over the wall to ops. That's not a good case. When we're thinking about culture, when we're thinking about the mistake, we want to actually empower the people in dev to take this over. But it doesn't just lie there. What about the responsibility of ops to actually drive the requirements and what is needed in the, in, in the market? So really, instead of coming at the end and saying, well, sadly, you threw that over at us and we don't like it. What about the ops responsibility to actually be involved upstream? So everybody gets more responsibility and there's much more shared responsibility and alignment across the flow of value. The sixth mistake that we're seeing is unwillingness to invest in infrastructure. Yes, we all want this. We all want it to run fast. We want to deploy quickly. We want to um, uh, um, validate the hypothesis quickly. But we're not willing to invest in anything. Now, I want to show a short video here just to, to try to get a point across. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's the tenth time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped. Now, when I show this video, I, I, I sometimes get a lot of laughs, but this is a serious thing. How did that happen? I mean, in the first case, there were only four crewmen allowed on, on the track, but let's say they were allowed to have 50. It would have still taken a long time. It's not magic what happened. That new car was architected for that quick exchange. If we want to deploy faster, if we want to build faster, if we want to validate the hypothesis faster, well, there's a cost to that. We need to architect our solutions. We were just talking about separating deployment of releases. Well, I need to architect my solution to actually allow for that. We're going to talk about measurement later. I need to architect my solution for telemetry. If I want to deploy quick, quickly, I need to architect both my solution and my delivery pipeline to enable me to build fast, integrate fast, test fast, uh, uh, deploy fast, and release easily and recover from problems. If I don't architect for that, if I don't invest the, the time needed for this, I'll never be able to actually move faster. It will always hold me back. I'll always need to slow down and, and think about how to do this. Um, years ago, and, and a lot of the things that are in the DevOps movement and, and in, in the Agile movement are built on lean underpinnings. And many years ago when, when lean started in Toyota, 
they had this problem where they had this good ideas of working better and single piece flow, but the machines that were stamping the parts were taking a long time. So they created this thing they called SMED, single minute exchange die, where they could actually take things to architect the, the solution so that it could actually exchange from stamping one part to an, a different part under a minute. Same thing applies today. A few years ago, I was working with a company. The VP of engineering comes to the room and says, guys, enjoy the current iteration. From the next iteration, we'll be deploying to production every iteration. And they were asking, how will we do this? He said, I don't know. You're the smart people. I hired you. I trust you to find a way. And they did. But he needed to come out and say, I, I need you to do this. And I understand that this might slow us down a little bit. And this will cause me money. But had he not put that goal in front and that vision that we need to architect ourselves for speed, they never would have gotten this. So that mistake of under-investing in infrastructure is really important. Then mistake number seven is ignoring lean and agile. So a lot of people who are doing the DevOps transformation are saying, let's just focus on the ops, on the DevOps parts. How do we make the deployment part from code onwards fast? So when the, we'll just start thinking about this problem from when code gets committed. And it is an important part of the problem, but it's just a part of the problem. So imagine that we're running with large batches. The development organization is still working in very large batches. They're releasing stuff in huge batches uh, that they're creating and integrating over time. And we have this amazing deployment pipeline at the end that really allows you to deploy things quickly. That's not helpful. It's actually hurting because we'll take very big batches through this very fast thing. And since those things are created in high batches, the quality is usually lower. We'll find more problems in production, which will be harder to fix because it's not just one thing. And whenever we find a problem, we have to wait for the next big batch. Not only that, this usually drives high utilization, which with large batches create a lot of variability. That means that every time we'll do it, we'll get different results. We'll take this huge batch and deploy it very quickly and get great results. And the next time we'll get bad results and we'll get different amounts of, of problems and, and um, variation on, on successes and times it actually takes that large batch to make it through. So we can't ignore that. We need lean agile thinking and development, working on small batches, whip limits, managing queue length to actually help us drive things through the rest of the work. You can't separate them. Now, there are differences. Agile, the development part is more product development. There's more variation there. We don't exactly know. The code uh, to releaseability portion can be more mechanistic, can be more automated, but it doesn't mean we can separate them. We need both of them. If you only have a very fast deployment with a very slow and batchy um, development, you'll have problems. And the other vice versa is also true. Let's say you have a very good development process. It's working in very small batches, but the transaction cost, the ability to actually deploy something to production, to test it, to integrate it, is very high. So what we end up doing is saying, every time we need to create a release, every time we need to create a deployment, we need to do three weeks or two months testing. So let's development please batch things up. So even though, though we could have sent things over faster, this new wall that is created by the high transaction cost is actually stopping us from pushing things to production faster. So we need both agile and DevOps to work together across the entire flow of value. And when SAFE is looking at this, SAFE looks at it from a holistic point of view. We're looking at the entire continuous delivery pipeline from idea to value and reiterating that with hypothesis-driven development. And we need to make sure we both have both an agile and lean development with an agile and lean DevOps capabilities downstream to actually enable all of this. So really ignoring lean and agile or ignoring DevOps is a huge mistake. The eighth mistake is not measuring enough. There's so much to be measured, and a lot of the Agile community historically has been sort of anti-measurement. If you measure this, this will drive the wrong behavior. And it's true, some measurements could be wrong. 
but really measuring a lot of things to identify, especially try to identify where are the problems? Where's the fat in the process? Where are delays? So if we're thinking of the flow of value across the entire value stream, there are places where we see delays. And this is a really cool thing. Let's say for a second that the current fat is an ops. And I will come to the VP of ops and say, there's fat in your organization and you need to trim the fat and improve your organization. He's not going to be happy. But what lean thinking has taught us is that actually a lot of the delays, a lot of the uh, waiting, a lot of the problems are not in any of the single steps. They're in the delays between the steps, in the time it takes between I finish a feature and I actually deliver it to the operations and I actually deploy it and I actually release it. Things actually wait. And the cool thing is there is no VP of delays. Nobody's getting up on stage and saying, I'm here to advocate more delays in our system. So actually, if you measure things and you try to identify the delays and you try to identify the problems and you try to identify the problematic segments, and we're going to talk about this a lot in the how do we solve stuff, really focusing on measuring and measuring the flow of value and measuring the success of things. So let's say we can get something to production very fast. What was the business impact? The fact that you deploy a feature is meaningless. Has he driven the right results? Have, has your hypothesis proved true? And really creating those kinds of measurement and overlaying them with the more pipeline data, so see how the business result is impacted by things we deploy and release, is crucial. And, and I, I still think that companies don't spend enough measuring the entire flow of value. Um, and this ties both to the front end, but to the back end. Uh, and, and, and I think this is really important, measuring the flow of value across the entire value stream. Then the ninth and last mistake is not preparing for recovery. You need to prepare for the worst. If you want to deploy faster, if you want to release faster as well, or release whenever there's a market demand for it, then you need to be prepared for what will happen when things don't go right. If I'm deploying continuously to production, what if something doesn't work? If I'm turning something on, what if the market doesn't like it? Or what if it's creating the exact opposite result that I thought? I thought this was going to drive engagement into our product and actually going to cause more people who are seeing our site to sign up for a, um, a trial version of our product. But what we're actually seeing is since launching this new visual out, uh, outlook for our website, actually the adoption rate has gone down. How fast will it take us to either roll back or even better, fix forward? That is, say, okay, I know what's wrong. Instead of just rolling back to the old functionality, can we just fix the problem and then get it quickly through the delivery process and get it running in production? And I mean, you see stuff like what Netflix has done with Chaos Monkey. The ability that there's actually something out there running, creating havoc in a production environment stopping servers, dropping databases, and you need to make sure that your application is robust enough to support it. And uh, during the, uh, one of the large out outages that we had, Netflix was least impacted because they actually prepared for it. So really thinking about, on the one hand, how do I prepare, how do I rehearse some of the failures? Um, and how do I architect my solution to allow me to roll back or fix forward turn off something, resume the old operations very, very quickly. So if we have something that we can actually really trust, and we know that if we turn it on and it's not doing the right thing, we can quickly turn it off, you can start building a lot of trust between dev and ops, but it doesn't even stop there. What about the business? Start, I, I started talking about from, per, from product development, from product management, but what about business? You build a lot of trust with the business, showing to them that you can actually deliver value faster, but also showing them that the consequence of their making a wrong, mistake or wrong decision isn't that bad. So if they have a hypothesis and they're testing it and it's not working, no problem. We'll just turn it off or fix forward and we'll test another hypothesis. The more they understand this new thinking of testing small things in production, the faster we can get to actually having a better hypothesis-driven development. And and this is really important. 
So those nine mistakes that we see organization making is driving them to actually create poor results and actually achieving suboptimal results for their customers and really not getting the best financial results that they can have as far as being profitable, as far as uh, achieving more successful customers and more engaged and happy employees. This is crucial. Those mistakes are crucial. But then what do I do? So it's really easy to just talk about the mistakes that people make. I want to give you a, um, a six-step simple plan that will actually help you work your way toward improving this. So it starts here. If you want to improve your current state, the first is to actually know what it is. And it seems really trivial, but from experience, a lot of companies don't actually know this. And when I talk about what the current stage is, I actually talk about this. This is our continuous delivery pipeline in SAFE. It's, you can see the value stream under this, this, this continuous delivery pipeline. We're talking about continuous exploration, continuously thinking what customers want, continuously integrating the work, continuously deploying it to production, and then releasing on demand. So when we look at this whole thing, how is it performing right now? Not just the deployment part, not just the build part, all of it from idea to value how is it performing right now and what we're doing with with customers was actually taking them through a process called value stream mapping that is you start by actually going through the what are, what are the steps that we're going through and this is just an example so we could have an idea generation and then an analyze step and implement and then we're going to validate it on staging and then we're going to deploy it and then we're going to release it but validating on staging um, could take us a long time because right now it's very manual and we have to spawn up the environment and we have to put it on there so something where the PT which is the process time is just one day it takes us just one day to actually validate in a staging environment takes us 14 days overall because the overall time it takes us to start something and then get it over and then load it and then wait until that person is actually available to spawn another environment for us and all that works taking lead time is 14 days out of which just one day is actual work what about implementing or analyzing analyzing here is a, a great example where you have a hundred and twenty day lead time so from the time I had an idea until it actually made it into the backlog so that somebody could develop it, it took 120 days, but only five work days. And the third part here is complete and accurate. So how many things that were actually built up and moved to the next step actually had to move back because they had problem? So for example, if we look at the deploy step here, we can see that there's a 90-day time it takes from something is ready on staging until operation actually takes it and deploys it to production. Over this 90 days, they only have three days of work. But actually, 50% of the things that they're getting, they're unable to deploy or have problems that need to be reworked back in implementation. That's not good. So getting people to actually start mapping what the current stage is is very important. A lot of people are not even aware of the current state, and they have to go out and really get this data. What's the complete and accurate rate? What is the lead time? What's the process time? And really building this out. So this is the first thing. You need to identify what's the current state. Then you can identify future state. Well, here's where we want to be. We want to be, and it doesn't have to be a future, future state. This is where we will be in five years. What's the next step we want to go to? So the next step is we want to have a 70% improvement in lead time, 35% improvement in process time, 100% improvement in activity ratio, and we're going to spend a lot of time doing some automation, and we're going to improve a rolled and complete and accurate by 2,000%. So this is our new flow of value. So if we had that deployment that was 90 days to 5 days, it's actually going to go to 5 days in one day. And that 50% complete and accurate is going to go up to 85% complete and accurate. So we identified this is where I want to go. Great. Step number three, what is stopping you? So what is stopping us from actually going from where we are right now? What are our impediments to flow? What is stopping us from moving from where we are to where we want to get to? So we're starting to go through those steps and talk about, well, the ideas are unclear. We're lacking automation here. We're lacking automation here. Uh, we can't decouple deployment and releasing, which means every time we deploy something, we, we really release it. So we have to be very careful with what we do, and that takes the deployment step 
a long time. We're lacking some measurements, so it's very hard to release. There's no quick way to roll back. Uh, the mean time to restore service is very long, so we're very cautious in what we do. A lot of stuff that is what is stopping us from actually getting to where we want to go. But that's not enough. We have impediments. What is causing those impediments? So step number four is finding the root causes. Actually so going in. Yeah. I was going to say, Imbo, you, you've talked a lot about um, um, automation and um, some, you, you talked earlier about automation kind of getting ahead of, of maybe some uh, the, the whole value stream. So people may be implementing really top-notch DevOps capabilities, with, but the, the upstream parts aren't working as well or vice versa. Yep. Um, and we know that even when we put automation in place, um, it's, it's difficult to track value. So we talk, one of the things I think is that's big about uh, about uh, safe and, and things that our, that our customers are talking about as well is is not just building code and pushing code out, but they're actually tracking it in terms of business value. Yes. Um, but it's difficult once once uh, uh, something in the backlog gets, gets converted into code and it gets into the DevOps pipeline, it's really hard to track that in terms of the actual business value statement that was stated as maybe a feature. What are your thoughts on on the importance of visibility to be able to track that business value all the way through to to the the validate hypothesis state uh, in this diagram versus just at some point no we're no longer tracking value we're tracking code. So so I would say this is an excellent question because we're going to answer this in a, in a few slides, but. It's it's really important that when we're tracking a lot of the time when we move from implement to validation and then over to the more deployment side of the of the pipeline, people are really thinking about code. Code is not enough. I mean, tracking code is important, but we need to actually think about how does that code tie to features and 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 value. Now that we're deploying code faster, are we delivering features faster? Let's say we're only de delivering small chunks of code that overall don't aggregate, and the overall feature still gets released in a long time. We're not providing value to our customers. We're not running this. And really having the, the right systems, and, and we're going to talk about it in the last step, of measuring this on the feature level is crucial. That's really crucial. And, and actually, when you're doing the, so the step four is defining the root causes. And I was talking to a friend a while ago, and he actually had a, a, a cool example that ties to what you were talking about, Lee. So they were doing this current state and future state, and they ended up with the problem is in testing. Great, everybody was happy. It's not my problem. It's more downstream. I can get out. But when they were doing root cause analysis of why does the testing step take so long, it actually turned out that it is taking so long because the build part of it is sending things that are so bad and not doing enough unit testing and acceptance testing that it's very hard to actually test them and they take a long time. So a lot of the time when we find problem that right now what's blocking us is the deployment stage. But what actually is causing the deployment stage to take so long is that the build stage has an architected environment with feature flags. So we need everybody across the value stream to work together within those uh, steps to actually try to understand what is where are we right now, where's our goal, What's stopping us from getting there? What are the root causes for that? And how can we work together to, to implement them? Then really build an implementation backlog. That's step number five. What can we do right now? So really take those things, think about those root causes and say, what is a small thing we can do tomorrow morning? What's the next thing we can do next week? What's something we can do in the next uh, month or in the next PI program increment, three months? And really try to start getting those long hanging fruits and then harder and harder stuff to actually go um, better and, and, and improve and start getting to that future state and testing. Because some of those things that we were doing root cause analysis and we were thinking if we change this, this will improve that step, that's also a hypothesis. We need to validate that that change, that change in architecture, that change in automation really is taking us where we want. And until we know this, we don't know what we should be doing. So this step is really important really getting it down to actionable things that we can actually put in the backlog and start working on tomorrow morning. Then the last step ties back to what you were talking me. You need to actively manage, manage the flow of the pipeline. So we have an idea, but and we have ideas to how to improve that. We need to actively manage this. So really have some kind of Kanban system in the tool. It will allow me to really track where my features are. 
what's in analyzing, what's in backlog, but also what is currently deployed to production, what is currently being released, how are we evaluating the benefit hypothesis, what re result are we getting, and if we're managing the first part of the, f of the flow, funnel to implementing, in features, but we're managing validation through done in code, then we're missing something. Really visualizing this whole thing as a flow of value on a feature level, and by the way, even higher level, and so slow, uh, smaller levels, so really watching the flow of stories, and the flow of features, and the flow of capabilities, and the flow of epics, is crucial to actually making sure that what we thought we'll be making in the future state, and the improvements we're putting into place, will actually get us where we want to go. Now, Lee, this, this ties back to everything we've been talking about. I mean, if, if we can't measure it, if we can't track it, then all the things that I've been talking about in the mistakes and in the, um, in the how to improve this doesn't work, right? Right. Yeah, and and this is this is just a few views from from version one, um, because we we've, we've been uh, tackling trying to tackle this problem for a couple of years now, um, not just uh, value mapping the value stream and and knowing what that is and and start to look for ways we can improve, but we realize that we, you don't know what to improve until you can measure it, right? Until you can actually see things. So a couple of things we we've really tried to do is enable organizations to be able to track the flow of value by feature or track it by package or any, any, way, any way they need to to kind of get those kind of cross-referenced views and, and really know what they're doing in terms of getting features, valuable stuff to their customers, not just code. Um, but we also try to are, are implementing the, the the lower level measures that are over that are typically not measured on the DevOps side. We we have we can measure cycle time when you certainly have Kanbans and and uh, and put measures in place uh, you know from from strategy down through development but we can kind of it kind of gets opaque once it gets into the DevOps pipeline. Um, so we're thinking that that this will do a couple of things. One is it will uh, allow uh, organizations should really track value all the way to the customers in terms of what how they express value upstream in their features but also I think by measuring that and keeping that connection there that when it comes time to evaluate the hypothesis then uh, an organization can not only evaluate the hypothesis in terms of what was the, did this feature hypothesis uh, actually, did we realize this or did it bear out or did it change, but we can also tie that to the specific code changes that were made. So it becomes, it makes it more efficient to be able to go back and take action on that hypothesis. And, and I remember you guys were showing me some of the of the data-driven graphs that you can actually create in the tool that will allow you to actually see some of those process times and lead time, touch time and lead time to actually see where where are we getting stuck and where are the problems in the process. Yeah, and I think I think the key for us really is is um, is looking at the entire value stream as one. You mentioned earlier about everybody having responsibility for that. And uh, I remember talking to one of my colleagues at version one about a year ago, and, and I said, what if nobody in the company got paid until the thing that they built shipped and then the customers liked it and paid for it? How would that change how the company behaved? And this is really kind of helping to, to bring this all together by giving that visibility across across the value stream. Of course, the cult, it all starts with culture, just like you said, the yeah. first seat in Calmer. But what we're trying to do is, is provide instrumentation and, and provide tooling and a platform that'll, that will help uh, support that culture. Yes. I, I think now's the time for us to open it for questions, if there are any. Yeah, great. Um... We have gotten some audience questions in, so we'll go dive right into those. But before we do, I just want to remind the audience that there, uh, there's time to get your questions in. If you have a question for Inbar or for Lee, just go ahead and use that control panel and put the question in. Let's take a look at our questions. The first one is, can we call such decouple and deploy as piecemeal releases? Um, so again, I'm trying to decouple the concepts of of, of deployment and releasing. So it's not necessarily piecemeal releases. You can release piecemeal, but deployment should be done continuously because we want to constantly make sure that our stuff is ready in production and being uh, tested in production to make sure that it's actually working. But we want to release whenever there's a customer need. That's why in, in SAFE we call it development cadence release on demand. 
the, we do things continuously, we deploy continuously, but we release whenever there's a need in the market. Maybe it's piecemeal, maybe it's chunk by chunk, maybe it's larger chunks. It really depends, on, and it depends on the industry, it depends on the current trust with the customer, and it's really different if you're working with a B2B or B2C um, and, and what they're comfortable with and what is the impact on other things. So sometimes you will batch releases more. Um, sometimes you will want to connect them to a market event or something happening or a calendaric event. We want to release this functionality in time for Christmas. But if you don't have it there ready f so that the people who are driving the business can actually turn it on and off and to the right audience, when the need is there, then you're not enabling your business to actually run as efficiently as it can. Okay, great. Next question, is it applicable to earn one SEU then under which category? Um. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's going to be an administrative thing. We'll have to get back to them on that. That's about uh, PDUs and continuing education um, mm -hmm. credits. So we'll, we'll, oh, okay. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that one. Um, gotcha. there, there's one, while I've got the mic open, the last one that came in, I think, is actually a very good question. Um, um, and if you don't mind, I, I'll let, no, let me just right ahead. This, this one. Yeah. So, Inbar, the question was, uh, uh, or actually the statement was, great information, uh, loved it, it made a lot of sense, but can you kind of tie this together and, and answer the question that's raised in the title of the, of the webinar, which is how to build a continuous delivery pipeline? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the six-step program w was the thing. There is no magic. There is no one way. The, the context is king in this thing. So it started by actually identifying where we are, saying where do we want to go? And where do we want to go in the upcoming, let's say, six months? Then identifying what are the, what's currently stopping us from going there. And then saying where do we need to now focus on building our, our, our pipeline? Everybody has a pipeline, by the way. This is, when we're saying building, it doesn't mean building for something that doesn't exist. There is a pipeline because you currently have ideas and you're turning them to code and you're deploying them and you're releasing them. The question is not do you have a pipeline, it's how efficient is it. So the title of the talk, Building, is building it to a better future. And so the, the, the idea is to actually focus on where do we want to go, what's stopping us from getting there, what are the root causes for that, and then really come up with a concrete plan to addressing those things. And it's a it's an iterative process. So we will start and identify the current thing that's stopping us is something about the architecture of a product. Let's fix that. The next thing that's stopping us is we need to have a better way to actually deploy uh, um, to production. Let's do that. Then we need now to have an infrastructure, uh, an, uh, an infrastructure as a service. Okay, you need to constantly focus on where the current pains are and just do them. I wish I could really give you a presentation that would say, just do this and you will get a perfect continuous delivery pipeline. It's not that simple. You have to focus on everything from idea to delivery, really try to identify where the current blocks are, and then improving them gradually. It's a gradual process. Okay. Yeah, and then Bar, I, I, would, I would just add to one, one of the comments that we get a, a lot um, from from our customers and, and, and folks that we talk to is, is that there's, they see a lot of value in being able to measure in the DevOps pipeline because uh, they, you can't just go to your CFO or your CIO and say, I, I, I want, you know, X hundred thousand dollars or X million dollars to build a DevOps pipeline. Uh, you have to do just what you were saying, which is you have, you have to know what those steps are and you have to be able to see which of those steps is most constrained to be able to say, I need to, we need to invest here and here's why and be able to make an economic argument for that. If, if I go to my CIO and say, deployment is currently holding ready features, they're ready, they're done but it's being held up in, in, in deployment for 120 days, but they actually spend one day doing that work. Imagine we could release features to production 120 days earlier. What's the value in that? What's the cost of delay? So how much are we losing money by not actually releasing the value? Is that worth paying that amount of money by, by on buying more hardware, investing in infrastructure? That's how you build that case for, for change. Otherwise, it's uh, let's invest in DevOps because that's a trend too hard to sell, too vague. I think being really data-driven is, is super important and really visualizing where you are right now, what's the current flow of value, um, and actively managing the, the cues and where things are happening is, is key. And every time we've done this with a company, they were actually surprised 
by the current flow value. Nobody had an actual complete view of the entire value stream end to end of where things are happening, how long they're taking, what's the, com the complete and accurate rate. It's amazing how much just visualizing this information is important. Okay, great. Doing a quick time check. We have about five minutes to the top of the hour. I think we can get to one or two more questions before we close things out. Next question, what is the importance of enterprise architects at the idea generation stage or the first stage? That's, that's a great question. And yeah. again, um, a lot of people, when they talk about Agile, they're saying, well, there is no role for an architect. SAFE clearly disagrees. We have roles for both enterprise architect, system architect, solution architect. They're the people who will actually help us make sure that when we're building large things at scale, we're readying some of the architecture ahead of time. That means if we have the train running, instead of the train needing to lay down the tracks as it's running, somebody's thinking of those tracks. So I think involving, um, when we're looking and safe at safe, the whole continuous exploration, and by the way, the entire flow of value, architects are part of it. They need to continuously think about what is needed, what is needed to be able to enable the things that the business wants, but also they need to be constantly talking to operations about what about the architecture of our constant, of our current solution is inhibiting us from deploying, releasing, or measuring the things we want to be measuring. So enterprise architects are a key, uh, and, and by the way, not just enterprise architects, system architects, but architects in general are a key um, um, important thing in, in safe and in a scaled agile and lean environment. All right, great. Next question. Currently, my client does not have a uh, like one kind of tool, but does such tracking on pure Excel sheets. How can we? Con how do we convince to get one such tool so that the client can visualize the value of CD and CI? So yeah, I'll, take, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be perfect. <laughs> We, we can talk about it. We, we, uh, that's, that's a common question that we get. Uh, we're working on spreadsheets or we're working on uh, a tool that may have worked you know, at, at, some, at a team level maybe, but didn't, uh, didn't really give us the, the visibility uh, that, that we need to be able to see the entire value stream and, and, and in the context of this conversation, be able to see uh, how DevOps plays into that. So. Um, I'll, I'll stop short of a commercial for version one and just say we, we'll, uh, we can, we'll get back with it on, on that one uh, offline. But uh, if, Imbar, if you have some general tooling things to say, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, think, I think part of the thing is when you actually map up the entire flow of value and you do this exercise and management starts seeing how much information they don't know and people start seeing how much they don't understand Ops is missing information from Dev, Dev is missing information from Dev, and how much we don't understand the entire flow of value. I think this really drives for the importance to actually be looking at a single tool, at a single source of truth to actually agree on what are our problems that we're trying to solve. And I think, again, this, this will drive it that we don't, those Excel sheets are, are not giving it the enough visibility, and different people are seeing different things, and we can't improve our process that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, if we do it very quickly, we have legacy applications where the code base is in version control but has not fully realized continuous integration. Do you think we can still benefit from building automated deployment pipelines? So again, as I was saying, you shouldn't be building anything by themselves. Focus on the flow of value and see what's currently stopping you. If the thing that is currently stopping you is the automated deployment pipeline, the answer is yes. If the thing that's currently blocking you is actually more upstream, then no, don't start with that. Start with the right place. There's a great video by Scott Pru um, about DevOps in legacy environments and how they were doing it with really legacy mainframe environments and the, and the amount of automation that they put in there. And I highly uh, um, recommend going to that video and actually watching it and seeing uh, how can we achieve really great results even with legacy environments. All right, great. Well, I wish we had more time because we've got some really great questions that are still sitting here. Um, if, you, uh, if you didn't get your question answered, I'm sure uh, Inbar and Lee would be more than happy or the folks at, at their respective companies will be more than happy to follow up with you and get you the answers you're looking for. Um, but um, 
I did want to remind everybody that uh, today's webinar has been recorded and you will be receiving a link to the uh, to the webinar on demand. Um, it'll also be on the devops.com website. Also, please check the devops.com website for upcoming webinars. We have a ton of webinars listed there and hopefully there'll be something there that uh, piques your interest. Um, but uh, Inbar and Lee, thank you so much for giving such a great presentation. It was uh, so chock full of information. I, I, I know I got a lot out of it. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to. I just want to invite people to go to scaledagileframework.com to read more about Safe and look at some of the case studies that we have there and just delve deeper into the, some of this material. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, uh, again, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, the moderator for today's event, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.